Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, depending where you're situated in the world, I hope you're joining us either with coffee in hand or perhaps evening drinks. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our first uh, Community Day live broadcast event. It's an exciting time. We're going to be hearing from a lot of people during the day. Uh, we've got three different sessions that we'll be managing with a wide range of speakers, a whole number of different community engagement activities, a bunch of exciting videos, a, a range of physiological experts all coming in. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting stuff throughout the day over our three sessions. So we hope that you're going to join us multiple times as well. Uh, there's very little repetition in the content, so if you're joining us now and think to join us uh, in four hours and then later on in the day, then uh, we welcome you and we'll try to keep it live and dynamic throughout. Uh, we're going to be uh, going through a number of uh, different presentations and video formats, question and answer, so there's a lot of content here and we hope you'll stick with us and enjoy that. Before we get started and I introduce my co-hosts, I want to bring out a few announcements. There's been a lot of exciting stuff going on at GUE. We're keeping uh, very busy. Uh, we've got uh, quite, quite a lot of things going across the spectrum that we're gonna be talking to you about and bringing in during the day, showing some examples and letting uh, people see some of the activity we have. Uh, one of the first announcements I'd like to make uh, is that we have a new Community Day uh, t-shirt design and uh, that's from Chris Hart. And I just actually spoke with Chris and his uh, new GUE Midwest-ish, I love the name, community. I did a short presentation and a discussion with a great group of folks out that way uh, just yesterday. And Chris gave us a nice idea uh, building on the GUE mission, a uh, group of divers emerging uh, from the shore with scooters in hand. Uh, it's the same uh, uh, logo that we have on our uh, Community Day banner. So you'll see some shirts uh, out there with that. Uh, I also wanted to mention our Next Gen Scholarship Program. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from Annika later on today. And uh, Annika is such a great lady that we're gonna give her effectively two years of uh, Next Gen Scholarship. Uh, realistically, we just, uh, we, we love her and wanted to give her a good opportunity and the challenges with COVID created a lot of uh, difficulty. Morning, Mohamed, nice to have you here. Uh, created a lot of difficulty to getting her around the world. So we've extended that and we're not going to choose a, a new scholar this year. And we're going to uh, extend that and give her as much opportunity as possible. So look to a future scholar and updates from her uh, later on in, in the broadcast. I also wanted to mention an exciting new innovation at GUE. We've just appointed a new democratically elected GUE Training Council. So we're playing around now uh, trying to bring a little bit more diversity uh, into the decision-making process within the leadership of GUE. And we've, we brought together a very nice diverse group. Uh, we allowed a number of uh, different groups, three different groups within the organization to vote for candidates of their choice. Uh, five from the instructor core, five from instructor trainers and evaluators, and five from the board of directors. So we had 15 of those excited to have the, that new uh, council organized. And we've had our first meeting and uh, we're, getting, we're getting started with that. And then my final piece of announcement content, uh, we have our GUE TV contest has been extended. And we've done that for obvious reasons. It was really difficult for people to get their videos organized. Uh, in, in a time period where many couldn't go diving. And we really wanted to give everybody a chance to partake in tremendous number of great prizes. Thanks really to all of our excellent sponsors. Uh, we've got Shearwater and, uh, and uh, Santi and Halcyon and uh, a few more that we'll mention, uh, DiveSoft as we go through the day. Great groups of sponsors and uh, we're gonna extend that contest. We hope that you'll keep that in mind and that you'll submit to your great videos and your wonderful diving activities in the very near future. Daron, great to see you as well. It's awesome to see all of you joining from all over the world. Some of you I haven't actually seen in a while. I miss seeing you. Uh, so keep up the comments and keep coming in and joining us as we go through the day. So now I'd like to bring in our co-hosts. Uh, there's gonna be primarily three of us uh, sort of doing a lion's share of the lifting. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Dorada Cherney. Many of you know Dorada. She's uh, on the board of directors at GUE, and she's also a recreational administrator. She's doing a ton of uh, work for the organization, and she'll be engaging uh, with me uh, together with Nico, who is also running our YouTube uh, uh, platform and organizing today's community live stream. So we're going to be excited to have both of those uh, uh, tremendous talents joining us uh, as we move uh, through our day and as we uh, host uh, throughout the sessions. So 
Uh, we're going to have a, a, a number of great people here today. I see people all over Beijing. Um, I see, uh, yeah, what are we all? Uh, Philippines, Holland, great groups of people. Uh, so we're really excited. Please be sure to uh, add your uh, questions uh, throughout the day. And so we can we can really answer those as we go along. Uh, that would be uh, really much appreciated. That way we can really interact with our community. This is really meant to be kind of a replacement for uh, you know an in-person meeting. We had a great 20th an anniversary celebration uh, and that was really a lot more fun in person. Oh, here's Dorada joining us now, my co-host. Uh, uh, hey, good morning, everyone. I was just prattling on about last year's conference, 20 year celebration. It was really great to see everyone. Nico, welcome, sir. Morning, Nico. Uh, hello, hello. My, hello. Other, my other host, great to have both of them here today. And I'll finish up that thought. We're, we're, we're really trying to substitute in-person meetings. We all, we know it's not gonna work out as well if we could go have a beer afterwards, but we hope we can make this entertaining, especially with my two uh, sterling hosts. Uh, we have the, the holy trinity of hosting. <laughs> You want to say hi to the community, either of you? Um, yeah, I'm really, really happy to be here as always. Uh, I said to you off camera before, we've got a stunning sunrise coming up over Wembley Stadium here. It's a good day. I've, I'm absolutely blessed and thankful for the amount of people that are tuning in, given how early it is in some places. It's, it's kind of hitting the bill, isn't it? It was meant to be an international community day. I'm seeing a lot of internationalness in the in the comments. It's great. And long it comes in. It keeps the fun coming. part, if we can bring people in, some of whom are having a gin and tonic and some of whom are drinking coffee, that might be the, you know, the full filter. <laughs> Just don't come in with a gin and tonic if you're at the dive site. Let's at least right. you know, keep that under control. The coffee, okay. Turkey, so Finland. we're excited to have everybody coming in and we've got a lot of people that will be radioing in from their location. If any of you have that opportunity, uh, please do so. Uh, but I think we're ready to go. Do my co-hosts have anything? I think we can get started with Marcus. Yep, let's let's bring him in. I will uh, just jump out now and let's bring on Mark. I'm going to bring in Marcus. Marcus is doing a lot of great work for the organization, coordinating a number of different projects. Uh, he's an instructor for GUE, and he's also coordinating our uh, various community regional representatives. And so this was a key position that we needed for the organization to help bring in various uh, regional communities. And Marcus, you've, you've volunteered for a tremendous number of things. Thanks very much for that. And uh, we, we welcome you here as you have a beautiful sunrise uh, in the background and you're heading off to do some nice diving in Scapa, I understand, right? That's right. Yes, you're up to uh, Scapa Flow for the whole week, diving uh, some fantastic First World War uh, German wrecks, which we're very excited about bringing the GUE Scotland community together. Um, but yeah, a week of exciting diving, I hope. I'm jealous, but why don't we let you go ahead and, and talk to us a little bit. You're going to talk to us today about uh, organizing communities and, and how that's been going for you. Uh, and you can tell us anything that you want about your scapa diving as well. But I'm going to turn it over to you and, and go to it. I love the background. Beautiful. Sure. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody, depending where you are. As Jared said, uh, coming live from uh, from Scotland, where it's a uh, beautiful morning, slightly cold, but a lovely sunrise uh, and a lovely start to our, our week uh, heading up for the, uh, the diving in Scapa Flow, as, as Jared said. Scapa Flow is an absolutely beautiful place to dive. The, the conditions up there are, are, are great the majority of the time, so you can reliably get on the wrecks um, and a nice social way to dive as well with everybody living on the uh, on the boat together. So really excited about that. Um, thanks for the time for me to talk this morning. I, I just wanted to um, firstly introduce myself, as, as Jared has done, Marcus Rose, and, and, and the main reason for speaking is the community development role that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing with GUE. And just to let you know that I'm a point of contact for any questions or comments you may have on community-related matters within, within GUE. Um, I also wanted to thank all those that have put some time in to put this uh, day together. Hopefully there's lots of interesting content to come uh, throughout the day, which I'm certainly excited about, uh, about following. Uh, so hopefully it promises to be uh, to be a good one. Uh, if one thing uh, 2020 has demonstrated uh, with all the COVID challenges, it's been uh, the strength of communities and, and the value in them. Uh, and it's been really great to see over the uh, the past months uh, some of the initiatives that communities, uh, GUE communities in particular, around the world have uh, put together to, to keep people 
uh, entertained and keep people connected and, and communicating despite um, some, some periods of forced separation. Some of those have been online quizzes, which have been brilliant, uh, online social events, uh, and also lots of informative um, diving related videos as well, which uh, are available still on, uh, on GUE TV, just to, to give that another plug. Um, and GUE are also developing uh, a couple of other initiatives to, to help support those communities, such as a community-based application, uh, and also some additional material on, material on GUE.com, um, just, uh, just to again help connect GUE communities and, and, and connect people and, and bring them together for some, uh, some fantastic diving. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm really excited about the, uh, the rest of the day. Uh, looking forward to the content that uh, the various teams are, are going to bring together and present to us. Um, I'll talk to you again um, another couple of times during the, during the day. Uh, and we also have some of the GUE Scotland uh, team who will talk about Scapa Flow um, at the uh, 12 p.m. G, uh, GMT time uh, session. So we have uh, three or four of the Scot GUE Scotland divers who are leaving Scapa Flow and were diving there last week who are going to talk a little bit about what they've seen and done. Uh, and then we've got a very excited bunch of uh, six or more who are, who are heading over today to kind of take over the baton. So uh, hopefully you'll see uh, both uh, the excitement of what has uh, what has been and uh, a, a team kind of setting up and, 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 and the sort of setup that is in Scapa Flow to support us. So thanks very much. Uh, really looking forward to the rest of the day. Awesome. Thanks so much, Marcus. I think we're all enamored of your background. Uh, that's that's a, a really awesome setup. And it, it's uh, particularly nice as we uh, bring in people from all over the world. We've got Italy and New Zealand and uh, South Korea and Holland and uh, all over. And it's great to see so many friendly faces on, on top of everything. So thanks very much. I think that, that that's awesome. Have, what, would, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give for people who are looking to set up their own communities? Do you have any... Uh, Pearls of Wisdom, con contact you and you'll make it all happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, just setting up diving that uh, is um, accessible to all of those in the community. So not um, yeah, not making it too difficult, finding a, a nice, easy, accessible dive site and, and, and setting up regular events around, uh, around that location. And it just, obviously the diving then draws people together and gives something common to, to build on. All right, excellent. I think good advice. And I think often people worry too much about trying to scale it to something massive right away. And, you know, really just two or three people getting together and going down. And uh, it's really what we're all about as an organization, getting our nice, robust community organized and letting everybody have a great time. Uh, so thanks very much for your help coordinating that, Marcus. And we're going to pivot over and start to bring in some communities. So you go have a, a nice day and great to see you. Okay, shall we right. start to bring in our communities from around the world? Please do, Nico. Okay. Who do you got? Bringing them in right now. Let's yeah. first give a warm welcome to uh, Ryan in Australia. Morning, Ryan. How are you? Or afternoon? Uh, afternoon. Wherever afternoon. It may be. Yeah. <laughs> Great to see you, mate. Look, me. another amazing background. This is just really unfair. I feel bad that uh, I'm stuck in Hopefully you can't see the park bench that's just just off to the side. <laughs> I'm also going to bring in GUE Lebanon. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. And oh, I'm also oh, oh. going to bring in our divers from Beijing. In Beijing. Oh. Hi, guys. What's going on? How are you doing? Are they all at a bar? Are you guys drinking heavily back there? Well, I'll show you my bad Wherever you may be. And I'm from Beijing. I think they're very, very happy to be here. Can we mute uh, Beijing? We can indeed. Let's mute Beijing. Uh, that we're getting there. I don't want to make them be quiet, but let's. Uh, Let's mute All Beijing. Right, there there you go. Now, um, I'm going to leave Jared. You just tell me, you just give me cues as to who you want to give sure the floor thing. to. Let's, let's bring in Ryan since he was the first, and then we're going to talk. We'll go in the order that they appeared to us. It's great to have you all. Thanks for joining, and we're going to come to each of you in a moment. Uh, Ryan, let's say hello to you since you came in first. Great to see you, mate. Been a long time. Yeah, you too. Been a while. Yep. What been are you while. guys doing over there? Uh, just getting out diving. We had a good dive this morning on a few of the uh, wrecks in Moreton Bay here in southeast Queensland. Uh, we're getting out again tomorrow uh, on uh, the HMAS Brisbane, another one of the great uh, wreck sites here in Queensland. Uh, yeah. 
So lots of great diving. You guys have had a little bit Absolutely. of up and down, a lot of up and down struggle. Uh, COVID seemed like it wasn't going to bother you, and then it came in. Are you you having pretty good access for diving? Yeah, uh, up up here where I am is fairly untouched, uh, thankfully, I guess. Uh, but there's still a lot of internal border closures between states, so travel between the states is a little bit hard. But uh, everybody in their own uh, local communities is is able to get out diving for the most part uh, around the country, which is really good. I guess if you have to be quarantined in any country, New Zealand is among the best. It's a uh, New Zealand, Australia area. You've got such big, massive uh, regions to wander around. Australia, you've got, you can always go in the outback, right? If you get to. Yeah, of, yeah. Just go bush for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks, mate. Well, it's great to see you. Thanks, Thanks very much. I'm glad you're having some good diving. And yeah, uh, we'll be talking to you. Looking forward to seeing what everyone soon. talks about. All right. Later. Take care. Happy have a good diving. day. And let's bring in GV on Lebanon. How, how, how are. How is everybody doing in Lebanon? It's great to see you guys. Thanks hey, for doing that. Okay, so basically what we're going to do is we are going to share a very quick presentation um, about our about our community. Uh, my name is my name is Hana Khouri. I am a uh, Tech One diver, and this is Steph. She's a fundamental diver. So basically, what we're doing is we're going to be. I'm not sure if you guys can see everything that I'm sharing, but anyways, here goes. Basically, right. um, this is our dive center. It's located in a beautiful town in the north of Lebanon. It's called Batum. And basically, this is where we dive from. Um, just a quick show around the, the, the center. This is our gear room. This is the classroom that's fully equipped for all of our courses. Uh, this is the boat where we leave. And a really cool thing about diving from Batum is that it's got some beautiful historical landmarks. And as you can see in one of these pictures, it's the old Phoenician wall. Not gonna get into details, we're short on time, but basically it's really cool diving here. And Richard Walker, he has become a really, really good friend. He's visited Lebanon, he's, he knows the community really well. Uh, he's run a lot of courses with us that basically range from fundamentals courses all the way up to CCR courses, and of course, everything that's in between that. Um, one thing you will hear Richard saying is that he loves the social life, he loves the outings, he loves the food. Um, so this is this is something really really nice about our culture. Now another thing is that we had an IE a few years back, and uh, Gerard Ramashi he became our first UE fundamentals instructor here in Lebanon. And um, another thing we need to mention is that we had a project sea shelters for Project Baseline. This went back a couple of years ago. Uh, we built an artificial reef, we placed it in the water, and the whole idea was to bring some marine life. Um, onto a seabed that was basically void of marine life. And this was a really cool project. It was a really fun day. Uh, so basically this is it. We're GUE Lebanon and um, we do our diving, we have our fun. We basically meet every weekend in the same spot. Um, we have a lot of social events. And the cool thing about our community is that we're not just a diving community. We've become like a family. So. Basically, all of our activities are not just restricted to diving. And um, we're really looking forward to meeting new GUE divers around the world. And this is a great opportunity for us to present ourselves so that now everybody knows that we have a beautiful community here at GUE Lebanon. That's awesome. Thank Thank you. You. That's really great. Can you tell us what's your favorite dive there? You guys have a couple favorite dives? Yes, actually, there is a reef over here. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, so basically there's a really cool reef that we're actually going to go where we, we have a dive right there, uh, right now, sorry. Um, it's a really cool reef. It starts at around 30 meters, lots and lots of marine life. That's basically our top diving site over here in Lebanon. And that's right. Excellent. And you got a pretty good diversity there. Great social life, great people in Lebanon. And yes, we really we're a pretty all big time. community, we're, and we're very friendly. And as I <laughs> and as I said, we, uh, it, we we've become like a family. So it, it's really cool, and it's That's going awesome. really great. Well, it's awesome to have you as part of our global family and, and your nuclear family there. And we look forward to visiting yeah. our, our friends and in-laws in Lebanon. Some yeah. really great, great people in Lebanon. And uh, We would love really to have people. you here. Heck, well, then that's it. I'm coming. So Yay. thanks very much. <laughs> You guys have ticked all the boxes. Great community, great development. Thanks so much for making time and coming by. It's awesome to see you. Thank you so Thanks much for having us. Support. All right, take care. Bye, you let's, too. Let's come to that rowdy group in Beijing. How are you guys doing, Beijing? Come on, Beijing. Hello. 
Come on, wake up, guys. Hello, hello. Hey, hey. Are you here? <laughs> Are you here? Yes, I can hear you. How are you doing? Hello, JJ. Hello. It's great to see all of you guys. Uh, this it's is, been uh, too long. Is it's been too long since I've been to Beijing. Uh, things are better now, so we're supposed to be a much bigger group, but some of us uh, have some work issues, so... Are you here? Yes, I can. It's a bit noisy with some of the background, but we can hear you. Yeah. We have the Chile instructor and some tech and cave divers also have some uh, students who want to know more about our program. How, how, how are you doing? Uh, we're, we're doing great. Probably not as well as you. It looks like you've got the beers, the gin and tonic, and the spectrum laid out on the table there. Uh, you guys getting much driving in? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, at the January, actually, some of us went to the south of China at the Qiandao Lake with GB and Jinghui. And some of the uh, GOE divers, we did some uh, photogrammetry program. Uh, we went to some water village and uh, we went to some village underwater, which is very interesting. Uh, before, because of the COVID issue, so we are happy to go to any other part of the world to do the divers uh, diving. So we mainly uh, put our focus into our Chinese lake and some reservoir. Uh, at the south, at the north of the Beijing, we have a very uh, bad situation because of the our city has a deficit deficit of waters, and the visibility is about two and three meters. So for us, we find a stable and a good visibility place is very difficult. But since uh, 2018, we are very lucky to find a place at the uh, 218 kilometers at the Hebei province. There, there's the uh, one water reservoir, so we uh, start to building our little points there. We have uh, the concrete steps for us to easy to go in and out of water, and we have a little house there. Uh, we start to do our course and practice. But since uh, last year, uh, due to some administrative issues, the house and the steps are torn out. So our uh, condition became much, much worse. Uh, ho hopefully, we are uh, restart our uh, program soon. And now the epidemic is basically uh, under control, so we can do our small uh, events without a face mask. So we start to explore more uh, and more the water points to do our backup plan. And we have a, 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 this is a photo, it's from last week we took. Uh, can I show you this? I'm not sure if uh, yeah, you can. We can do it quickly. I have to jump in one minute. So if you got a picture, go ahead and throw it up there quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, we have this photo from last week. One low for everyone took this. All right. So lots of great diving there in Beijing. Lots of historical yeah. diving. You know, nice project baseline activities. Great group of people. Very modern, exciting city. Uh, you can throw that picture up if you if you get the chance. Uh, I've been there several times. It's really great. Actually, tra traveling through China is an amazing experience. Tons of countryside, beautiful history, amazing dry caves, and, and some pretty interesting diving as well. Uh, so good stuff. Uh, thanks very much to everyone from uh, Beijing. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, to see you maybe in another Hello, Ni hao, ni hao. Take care, all. Thanks very much for joining. Have a nice night. Okay, that's great stuff. So those were uh, three great updates from our communities around the world. And uh, now I'm excited actually to bring in Frock Tillman, who's gonna be talking to us uh, today. Uh, Frock did a really nice presentation at the GB conference uh, last year. She's the research director at Dan Worldwide. Uh, last year she talked to us about hydration and diving and I didn't think I had that much to learn about hydration and diving I, and, and she taught me that I did. So she's a great uh, resource. Uh, and she brings in a lot of uh, pretty exciting activities and knowledge to the base. Today, she's gonna bring us up to date on some of her current research. 
and we're excited to hear what's going on. Oh, oh great to see you again. Huh? Is your hand, do you have any injury? No, I'm just, I'm just cold. Oh, it's just cold. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Yeah, I North, North Carolina, you know. Like it's great to see you again. It's been a while. Uh, you know, not as nice as the last time we met at the conference last year. True. Uh, but definitely better than nothing. So how it's great to see you, and, and I'm really excited to hear what you have to tell us today. Are things going well for you? Yeah, yeah, I must say um, we have all come out of our lockdown and are back in the office and are keeping things running. So, yeah, I, I cannot complain, really. Excellent. Well, I hope that for the rest of the world as well. It seems like we're seeing little pockets of that development. Why don't you go ahead and jump in and tell us what you've got for us today? Will do. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for, I see so many people that I would like to see in person. And unfortunately, this is uh, not happening. I am going to jump right in it and share my screen. I hope this works. It worked when we tried it. Um, there you go. No, it does not. Wait a second. So what I what am I going to talk about? It's um, basically so. Can you still hear me? And can you see this? I can see you fine, and there I hear you fine, and now your screen is up. So you're good. fantastic. Love it. Okay, so. Um, those of you who know me know that I'm usually the one going into the field and putting probes on people. And I show up randomly at dive sites and ask people if they want to participate in research. And you, you can probably guess that at the moment that is a bit tricky. So we're not out in the field too much. So I had a few months to focus on other things that we can do in research. And that is why I called this little update here. I'm really not going to take up too much of your time. Um, research under the curve. So what I have been doing is working on two studies that I want to present to you today um, that might be of interest, especially for, well, for everyone, but a bit more for the technical diving community than for others. And the first one would be the Dan COVID study. We launched that three weeks ago. Um, responses are great. Uh, it's a five-year uh, prospective uh, survey on divers with COVID-19 infection. And um, if you had COVID or if you, if you suspect you had it or if it's confirmed by a test, whichever one, um, you can go to research.net uh, slash r slash Dan COVID study, or you send me an email and I'll send you the link. That is the other option. Um, it doesn't matter how severe that was for you, um, even people that were asymptomatic but have tested um, because they had to get tested, uh, antibody tested at some point. We enroll everyone. Um, if you've recovered or if you're still recovering, if you uh, know of someone who has had the infection, if you return to diving or planning to, um, then you're eligible to sign up for this. So if you're one of these 30 million that have uh, tested positive for it, then we want to hear from you. The initial survey is a one-time registration. It's 10 to 15 minutes um, where we want to know a lot of things. Some people drop out because apparently we want to know too much, but um, it's really, it's just for science and it's all confidential. And then we will reach out to you with follow-up surveys, up to nine surveys within the next five years um, to see how you're doing and where you are right now and what you're doing. We're interested in, in um, how severe the infections were um, for our divers. We want to know how quick the recovery was, if they had med medical conditions before, if they have residual medical conditions afterwards. Um, if you had any issues when you returned to diving, any respiratory distress, any anything else that was out of the ordinary, um, did you see a physician after the dive? If you did, we will reach out to you and ask uh, if we can have a look at the test results, especially if you've had a chest x-ray. Um, just to know as much as we possibly can about how this um, how this infection might have impacted uh, the diving community or each diving individual. 
I'm going to jump to the next study, and this is, I think, even more up your alley. Um, caustic cocktail survey is what we called it. We had planned to do that years ago, and then it kind of got lost, but now is the time. Um, I launched this two weeks ago, and I'm overwhelmed how many people are interested in this, and I'm really excited that this is happening. So, um, Caustic Cocktail, for those who are not yet rebreather divers, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, so, in rebreather diving, if you're scrubbing material that absorbs the CO2, uh, mixes with water, which might might be due to a leak in the in the unit, um, it can produce this alkaline, very toxic fluid. And if you inhale or or get that in your mouth, then this can have serious uh, effects. So it can can burn. Um, skin and uh, cause respiratory distress and many more things. Um, apparently, many people know about it, which is good. And what we wanted to know is, um, has having a caustic cocktail, does that have anything to do with the experience that the diver had before or not? Um, what is the immediate reaction? How is it handled by the diver underwater? Um, what first aid measures are taken? right then when it happens and moving forward once you surface and um, what what is the common knowledge about these cocktail, caustic cocktails and I was planning to enroll something like 200 people maybe and I was thinking ah, that will take some time to get that together we actually hit the 200 three days after I launched and we extended the study now because there's still people that that want to share their experiences so if you've had one or if you witnessed someone firsthand, so if your buddy had one and you helped um, getting him out of, of that stress, then we want to hear from you. That would be uh, under research.net slash r slash Dan Caustic Cocktail. And with that, I'm already at the end of what I wanted to tell you guys. If you have any questions that I cannot answer right away, or if you watch the, the stream, not live, but later, um, shoot me an email if you have uh, particular medical questions. We, we are a resource that you can use whether you're a member or not. So if you have medical questions, medic at dan.org. If you have safety or preparedness questions, now in the times of COVID especially, risk mitigation at dan.org. And anything that I can help with from the research department, I'm um, available, obviously, under my email address, but research at dan.org. So, anything concerning um, want to volunteer in studies, uh, want to know what we're up to right now, want help um, writing a proposal, um, to, looking for, for uh, research funding, that is all that I can offer. So just Perfect. let me know. That's really great. Those are two very relevant and important studies. So I don't think people in the general community appreciate how much Dan is doing and we're really grateful for a lot of the work that you guys are, are doing, bringing things like this forward. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, but I would like to ask for a, a couple quick questions. One would be, um, you know, what, what do you perceive to be the likely long-term or permanent consequences of, of a caustic cocktail? And what type of first aid should someone uh, receive if they believe or do know they had a caustic cocktail? So, um, apparently most people that, that reported say they've, they've they realized it was coming. Um, so when when it happens, the first aid you want to do immediately is you get off your loop, uh, you flush with whatever is surrounding you, and I hope it is water at that point. So um, fresh water or salt water, doesn't matter. And as long as you get this flushed out of your system, and then you should continue on your bailout if it if it is a really bad um, if, if you have a lot of toxic fluid in your in your loop, you don't want to go back on it. And then um, once you surface, and that can be, I mean, if you still have deco to do, that can be painful um, at times. Try to, to get through it. Um, I know that uh, many people have, uh, or many instructors, uh, have hammered it into their students that they have to to drink soda and while there's nothing wrong with it 
don't wait until you find soda. D please flush whatever you can um, out of your system. There's there's no need to wait until you get to a fridge with uh, with Coke. So it's really, really important to get as much of that diluted and out of your system as soon as you can. Okay, excellent. I've unfortunately had four of these, so maybe oh. I uh, should write you. <laughs> yes, and, uh, yes, please. <laughs> uh, depending on how new the rebreather is, so one of them was a backup rebreather uh, that hadn't been used yet, and that was really rough. What about the permanent damage? Because I believe that I have some. What What do you do? You think it's a real risk for people? Um, it, it really depends on how bad it is at that time. So how how much of that is inhaled or gets into your system and then how much gets out of it again. We do have reports already. I, I only quickly screened um, today what came in. Um, and we, we do have people that claim that their their vocal cords have uh, have permanent damage and that their voice has changed permanently. We do have uh, people that say, yeah, I, I have been coughing for three months after I had that cocktail and couldn't go back in the water. So yes, there, there definitely can be, um, can be damage. If it is permanent, permanent, I really cannot say. But I do hope that the, that the survey will help shed some light on that. Oh, fair enough. And that's, uh, I think, really important. And everybody should be very conscious of that. And the last thing, I could talk to you all day, so I, and, I, and I'm conscious that I need to jump. But I think it's uh, interesting for people. I wanted to make one point. A lot of people you know, perceive themselves low risk in the COVID category. And so they're not really too worried. And they're, I'm young, I'm healthy, da, da, da. And there seem to be a lot of pretty troubling uh, circumstantial symptoms that, that uh, remain. And I guess that's one of the main points of your study. Do you think that it's likely a long-term problem for divers? Um, that is exactly the question that no one can answer at this point, and I hope that the survey will help with that. It is We, we have so many scary articles out there right now with uh, case reports um, where, where physicians have started putting out information um, on single cases, and then, then all of a sudden everyone thinks that uh, that permanent lung damage for everyone who, who has ever po tested positive. This is not the case. If you have not had the respiratory distress, if you have not had the severe infection, if you haven't been ventilated, if you weren't hospitalized, you have very good chances of not, not suffering through the residual medical conditions. But we do not know yet. So looking at other respiratory diseases, y you should be fine. But this is one, one reason why we're doing this, to find perfect. out if, if COVID is different. Makes perfect sense. And, you know, in the end of the day, since none of us know how exactly we'll respond, we should just do our best to avoid it altogether. Uh, thanks very much. Some great information. Great work from Dan. We really appreciate everything you're doing for the industry. And really nice to see you. Thanks for making the time today. Thanks for having me. Take care. Goodbye. Awesome. Bye. Okay, I want to bring in our next uh, guest, uh, Rob Thomas uh, of Young Divers International, a UK cave diver and instructor uh, who's really trying to help the industry by inspiring and encouraging more young people to get involved, which is really great. That's what the sport really needs. Too many old, old people, too many of the old guard lying around, and we really need a lot more young people. Uh, Rob, it's a real pleasure to welcome you today, and I appreciate the great work that you're doing. Uh, welcome, and what can you tell us about? Hi. Uh First of all, thanks for, thanks for having us. Um, I've been been listening in all morning so far, and it's some really good content. So, uh, yeah, basically, I've, I've over the lockdown period had a bit of uh, free time, so decided to do something about it and and try and come out stronger on the other side. Basically, so this is not an idea that was was just from the lockdown. It had been talked about in previous previous dive shows and stuff like that. Um, but basically, yeah, the, the whole idea of the group is is basically to encourage the sort of under 30s to, to grow as a community themselves and not just tag along and, and make, basically make their own way and, and try and increase the numbers of young divers on dive boats and, and around the dive scene in the world, basically. So not necessarily just wrecks, could be caves, anything like that, really. Um, just the case of promoting and, and showing everybody what's possible not just what what they do on a course kind of thing and it's a, it's a place for 
there's a Facebook group first and foremost. Um, obviously, Instagram, social media is, is growing um, and we're looking into having a website as well. Um, but basically, yeah, check out the Facebook group, it's Young Divers International. Um, it's, a, it's just a place to promote the, the diving you're doing. It's not necessarily about advertising business. It's more a case of advertising the diving that's, that's being done by the individuals. Um, and, and yeah, just hopefully growing growing everything as a as a community that's great that's some great work we got to get more young people like you and me into the sport uh, so that, <laughs> you might be on the upper end of the scale you're, you're, yeah, you're not hey, you're not supposed to laugh at that you're supposed to uh, you're supposed to agree wholeheartedly absolutely, one quick question absolutely. for you uh, how many people have you managed to gather together so far has it been uh, moving along so, i mean the, the groups the group's got about 620 members now over the over the sort of month it's been active so i'm, I'm quite pleased with how it's growing and and for sure even not necessarily in the group specifically but just around social media i've seen from when i made the group or when the group was made um there's there's definitely been an increase in in young diving activity for sure and on the group it's a really great way of promoting what you're doing hopefully try and find dive buddies find people to dive with um all of those things start discussions it's not just a case of yeah this, this is what we're doing it's a case of trying to get some additional information and and hopefully that will help you on your way in in your diving journey excellent that's some great work thanks very much rob we appreciate what you're doing uh it's a great group of people and uh, certainly our, my generation has uh, left you guys some challenges so you better band together and uh, begin uh, working your way through it thanks very much for your help and for coming by today sweet yeah okay cheers have a good day take care rob that's some great work and I think really important to get the next generation of divers in. And speaking of the next generation, Nico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> um, more to the point, we've uh, I, I was just jumping in just to say for our next guest, we've actually got a really, really cool quick video to show. So I'll do that on your cue whenever you're ready. But uh, yeah, back over to you. Okay, awesome. Thanks for that heads up. And I thought that was a beautiful segue from the next generation to our next generation scholar. And apparently we've got a nice video uh, from Monica. Let's see what she's uh, presenting and then we'll bring her in and say hello. Go ahead, Nico, cue it up. There. That was a great introduction. <laughs> Some good dancing. That's the, that's good. I love it. I love the dancing. It's great to see you again, Annika. How are you doing? I'm really good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you going? Uh, I'm doing wonderfully. Uh, you know, it's been what a couple of weeks since we spoke last, and uh, and I, I want everybody here to know. You know, we we are enamored of the work that you're doing, and uh, you got a great, wonderful personality. You're doing some really important stuff. So speaking of what I was speaking to Rob about, which is the next generation of divers, you're starting at quite a young age and making people aware of the aquatic environment in general. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you're based in New Zealand and teaching grade school kids about ocean and environmental protection, which we were immediately excited about. Uh, I think that was, you know, that's just a really great thing to see. We need it desperately. And do I hear little kids in the background? Uh, yeah, there's a few people around me. Uh, we've just finished a walk along the coastline, and so I looked for some light under uh, under kind of this shelter. <laughs> All right, I love this real time activity. This is perfect. And so you guys were walking the coastline, teaching the the kids about what's on the coastline, just what's beneath the surface, and kind of the threats that are facing our ocean. And I guess for a lot of us, we all know what it looks like underwater, and so we can imagine, we can kind of look at a rock and go, what it would look like underneath. Uh, but for a lot of people, they wouldn't have that experience um, or be able to imagine what it looks like underwater. And so being able to show them through virtual reality and uh, actually take them underwater um, and be able to show them the impact that we're having, but also how amazing our ocean is, is pretty incredible. And I think That's last awesome. week we got to um, just over 30,000 students that we've taught over the last year and a half. Holy cow, that's amazing, 30,000. And roughly speaking, what kind of age is the range that you deal with most? 
Uh, we've taught from year one, uh, so that would be five years old, up to 18, 19. And then we're now doing um, a lot of adult groups, community groups, um, and very exciting. We're going to be presenting to the America's Cup teams uh, in a couple of weeks. So we're really broadening out our scope. <laughs> Wow, you're moving on to big kids. So then if you're doing big kids, I should be able to qualify. That would be, you know, my next question. Uh, so you are taking them underwater as well. So do they scuba dive or just snorkeling? Snorkeling, but my idea is hopefully I can inspire all of them to take the next step and learn how to scuba dive afterwards. Take right, away those barriers. <laughs> that, that's excellent. And then you're also using virtual reality, you said. So you're bringing people into the environment that way as well? Yeah, so we're working with New Zealand Geographic and they've gone along our coastline with a box fish camera and they've taken 360 videos, um, what it looks like in different areas. And then we can, uh, I guess, transport students what it looks like at the Poor Nights, uh, what it looks like up at the Three Kings, at the Kermadex, and then also a little bit closer to home, what it looks like around our bigger cities. Uh, and you can see the, the difference. You can see, I guess, the effects of overfishing. You can see um, pollution. And so we're just trying to teach through this experience. That's awesome. So a nice diversity. You guys have just amazing environments there, a wide spectrum of them. And so it's neat for people to see. And that's sort of an installed project baseline you know, concept. You're letting them see the changes that occur, which is so critical for people that age. That's great. How are the community activities going on there? Are you guys uh, able to get out pretty well? Yeah, so we've been uh, extremely lucky. Our lockdowns have gone really well. Um, and so we've been able to we're able to dive now. Um, and so we've still got a really good group down in Wellington uh, that are doing the coast, ghost diving. Um, and so they've been doing their projects have come back up. Um, and then we've, we've got, uh, I guess it started with uh, Project Baseline Lake Pupuki, which is now actually extended to a couple more lakes. And they're hoping to actually uh, document and look at all the lakes across Auckland and then eventually over um, Aotearoa, New Zealand. So definitely keep your eyes peeled um, to see what Evie and Tyler are getting up to because they've got ex some exciting plans. And then I guess the last one that our community is doing, um, every Saturday we, oh, sorry, every first Saturday of the month, we get together um, and do a GUE diving day. And it's very exciting that this October coming up is the fourth year it's happened, um, which is very, right. very cool. Happy early anniversary. That's awesome. That's great to see. Well, that's, that's really exciting. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us. We let you get back to those little kids because we know what they might do if unsupervised for too long. Uh, so that's pretty critical. I really commend you for the great work you're doing. You're doing it with grace and style. And it's exciting to know that we have people like you out there educating the younger generations. And hopefully we can really get them into the diving world as well. So let us know if we can help. Uh, you take care of yourself. Do Keep doing all the great work you're doing. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jared. Lovely to Bye -bye. be here. <laughs> all right, yeah. Great to see you. And that's awesome. So we're going to stick with our Kiwi New Zealand theme, uh, and we're going to bring in uh, Simon Mitchell in a moment here. Nico, do you have something else for us? Uh, yeah, just wanted to bring up for your next presentation, we've got some uh, some slides to go over. So let me know when you want to, me to bring those up, and I will have them playing for you in the screen with you and Simon, okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you, Nico. So many of you are, are familiar with Simon Mitchell. He's a tremendous individual who's doing a great service to the diving industry as an active technical diver and researcher. He's the head of the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Auckland as a prolific writer. Uh, his uh, primary specialty is also in hyperbaric medicine and he's an anesthesiologist and diving consultant and hyperbaric physician. And what's amazing is he's got all of that skill and talent. And on top of that, he's a really prolific diver. And so I get actual common sense answers and he understands where we're coming from as divers, which is really critical when you're trying to speak to somebody. And most importantly, he's just an all around great guy. So let's bring in Simon and see how he's doing. Uh, another Kiwi for the day. Simon, welcome mate, it's great to see you. Yeah, you too, Jared. And look, uh, congratulations on this format. It's awesome. Uh, a really good initiative that, you know, in these difficult times, bringing people together, I, I, you know, offer my congratulations. Good on you. Thanks very much. We appreciate that. And we, you know, we're really hopeful we could do something to help keep people together and keep people excited. It's a, it's a difficult time, as you know. Uh, and we've been talking about recently, I'm looking forward to hosting you on GUE TV here in the coming weeks. We're going to do a more in-depth interview. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to talk about that are sort of similar, though. You've had some cool diving recently. Uh, tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here. Yeah, well, that photo is the campsite at the Pierce Resurgence. It's a cave site uh, down in the South Island of New Zealand. Uh, no, no road access. All this stuff had to be helicoptered in. And I was lucky enough to 
uh, spend two weeks there in February just before the COVID thing broke uh, with uh, Richard Harris and Craig Challen uh, of Thai Cave Rescue fame. And of course, they're, they're well-known deep technical divers and a bunch of other Aussies and one or two Kiwis. And so that's Richard in this cave. Um, they've been going there for uh, quite a long time now. This is probably about their fifth or sixth trip. Uh, pushing the cave, uh, and this trip they pushed it to 245 meters, uh, which is a pretty awesome effort. You know, that's for 245 meters, quite a long way in, um, in six degree water, so 16 hour dive. And um, of course, most of that required the use of habitats. If you go to that next image, uh, that's one of the habitats. That's the 16 meter one. You can see there's all sorts of cables and wires going to it. This is a very elaborate operation. Uh, we had suit heating power from the surface. We had comms, uh, two methods of comms actually. You know, it was a really well set up operation. It took us about a week to set up the cave. And then if you go to the next uh, pick, that's actually Craig and Richard, the two, the two people on the right, Richard in the middle, um, just getting ready to set off on their big dive. So. They'd previously been to 220 meters, I think, and this time they got to 245 meters. And I had no interest in doing uh, anything like that, uh, but I did uh, spend a bit of time taking photos in the cave. Uh, my longest dive I, was a 125 meter dive for four hours, and I just about died even with suit heating. I didn't use the habitats. It's very cold. But if you go to that next picture, uh, the, one of my little projects was to take some Pete Mesley style light painting photos in the cave. You know, it's pitch black in these big areas and it's incredibly challenging to light them up, as you well know. Uh, and I think some of your guys have been doing a bit of this kind of stuff. So clamping the camera in one place and taking multiple photos while you paint the area in with light and then layering the photos on top of each other. If you go to the next picture, you can see the result of that. So that's... Uh, that's the 30 meter habitat close by and the 40 meter habitat a bit further down uh, with one of these light painting photos. And that's actually another one. Uh, that's the 40 meter habitat with me in the photo. Uh, now I'm well aware I'm talking to a GUE group here. So I, I would please ask you not to give me any any uh, shtick about my trim in that photo. I, these are, these are you know, they're time-lapse photos, so you have to try and stay very still. So I'm wedged in against the rocks there trying to stay still. Anyway, uh, yeah, um, that was... Hey, the too much respect for you and your contributions to give you a hard time about a little thing like that. We'll, we'll give you plenty of free pass there. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful pictures and an exciting project, and that's some serious depth. I mean, any any clinical problems, any any uh, subclinical clinical problems DCS-wise? Yeah, DCS. good cool. Uh, look, I, I, on this trip, none whatsoever, actually. Uh, they have had problems in the past. Uh, and look, you know, all of us in this game, we know that you have enough divers doing this kind of diving. You do see problems. Uh, you know, I was at Truck with Pete in November last year, and I think we had 45 divers doing, you, you know, two moderately aggressive tech dives a day. And we had four or five cases of decompression sickness, as we always do, you know, mild stuff mainly. Uh, but no, that Pierce trip, nothing. Uh, it was really That's good. impressive. You know, I find that as the, the more you get below 100 meters, the you know it becomes a mixed bag, and especially in that 120 to 150 range, it's pretty hard not to come out with something. So that's pretty that's pretty awesome, and that's cold water as well, which adds a, a big wrinkle. So hats off to you guys. Let me just ask you a quick question about you and I have talked about this and plan to talk about it more in our more in-depth interview, but were you prepared to do in water recompression or were the habitats the substitute for that? Or what would happen if somebody had been injured? Yeah, we were we were prepared to do it. Uh, when Richard and Craig came out of the dive, and in fact, pretty much all of us, when we got out of the water from any of the deeper dives, uh, we'd stay in our dry suits for an hour uh, just to make sure that we weren't developing any symptoms. But the plan would have been to use the uh, the nine meter, or sorry, the seven meter habitat and the uh, maybe the sixteen meter habitat. But we would have used the habitats. I, I think in water recompression and water that cold would be very challenging. Uh, I mean, you could do it. And I am a believer in in-water recompression. It's probably a subject not for now because it you know, requires a bit of detail. But 
we've recently spent a bit of time looking into it and you know defining the the advantages in an evidence based way uh, using David Doulet's access to uh, databases of US Navy experimental dives, we were able to show that really early recompression really does help, you know, and you might say, oh, we've always known that, but actually we haven't. And we've kind of proven that, and it, and it, it, that ups the the validity of the case for in-water recompression. And we've and also, that, uh, sorry. Is yeah. that, correct me if I'm wrong, is that particularly relevant in type two cases? Because that's where it gets really sticky, isn't it? Absolutely. No, it is. Uh, you know, the US Navy data that we got a, a hold of through David's, you know, work at NEDU quite clearly shows that some of the cases they treated very early with outstanding results uh, were type 2 cases. So, you know, serious neurological decompression sickness, so DCS across the whole severity spectrum. So yeah, we'll talk more it's about pretty that. Rough, but obviously it can it can progress in pretty ugly ways otherwise. So it's pretty nice. I, I'm just grateful that the community and the medical community is open to that discussion. And I'm really grateful for you and David and others who have been pushing this forward to the discussion point because it's just really helpful for us and I think could really be a lifesaver. So that's exciting. And I look forward to talking about that more in detail with you. We're going to go through some discussions on GV TV soon. I think my last question is not nearly as exciting, but I'm just curious about your take, giving your knowledge, uh, you know, as an anesthesiologist and as an active diver. Do you think these sort of low level, minimal response to COVID infections are likely to be causing us big problems as divers? How worried should we be to avoid it? Obviously, we're not going to try to catch it, but what it, what is your best guess on that? Uh, I think you need to be worried. I, I think that COVID infection is something that we should all strive very hard to avoid until there's a vaccine. Uh, I'm somewhat less sanguine about this issue than Frauke was. Uh, I actually think that there's abundant data uh, in the literature, published data, that show quite clearly that even people who have relatively mild expressions of the disease can have significant changes in their lungs and although the outcome is often portrayed as binary like you either you die which is not many people or you, you live and people just assume you live and you're fine actually there's a big group in that live group who have significant ongoing problems and not all of them are the ones that were admitted and ventilated you know some people with relatively mild presentations do have permanent lung, well, lung changes that look bad and we don't know how permanent they're going to be. She's absolutely right about that. But until we do know, I think, you know, the message for the community is that if you've had it, you probably should be assessed before you go back to diving and we should all try to avoid it. I'm doing my best, even though I'm at the front line. We're just lucky here in New Zealand that we've done pretty well in eliminating it from the community. All right, that's great. I, I see a lot of different organs seem to be potentially at play. We'd be more worried, I guess, about lungs than most, but I even see heart and brain and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, hopefully we'll look back on this and say, wow, it just wasn't as bad as we feared, but I'd, I'd rather do that than be the other way around. So encourage our community to try to be respectful. And uh, Simon, thanks really so much for coming to join us and for all the great work you're doing. You're really, you're really bringing a lot of great things to our industry and helping explain the complicated and, and dedicating hundreds of hours on forums and uh, conferences and, and online. So I really thank you very much for your support and we look forward to talking to you more later. You no, take that's, care. That's Have a, a good pleasure. day. Um, and, and look, I see that question from Anton keeps popping up. Let, we'll deal with it. Um, make sure you ask me when we do our GUE TV thing. We'll answer that question, Anton. There is an answer to it, uh, but not Is it tonight. a long answer? Is it a oh, complicated no, no. I think let, Let's leave it until uh, we... All right. We'll, we'll dangle it a little bit. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Thanks very much for your time, and you have a great day, okay? Bye-bye. Okay, that's great stuff. Simon really makes a tremendous contribution. It's really exciting to have him. Nico, I think we have a video coming up. Do we, sir? We do indeed. We've actually got quite a few videos. So um, obviously Community Day, we've got videos coming in now from the Netherlands, uh, one from Singapore, and uh, one of my personal favorites from, you wouldn't really expect this, but from Kuwait. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and roll those. You and me are going to be off camera for a few minutes now. Um, guys, just enjoy the videos. Excellent.
am I supposed to do? All right. Hi guys out there. It's the GOE Community Day. We are here in the Netherlands at the Lake uh, de Veldert, and we have a small team of divers collected here at the water site, and we are about to jump in the water. And yeah, we have been very lucky here in the Netherlands to be continuously diving throughout the year. And yeah, I am very grateful for that because yeah, every one of us has um, yeah, made great things happening this year, training continuously. And yeah, we just wanted to say hi. Yes, uh, I'm Derek Young. We have a very uh, diverse uh, GUE team here. Uh, Robert Young, Lars. Lars, Eric, who has been very uh, helpful in Water looks good and we are about to jump now. Hi everyone and welcome to Singapore Diving. I'm Gemma and I'm one of the GUE instructors who's based here. We have a pretty active GUE community and pre-COVID most of the time we would be travelling overseas to dive. Currently we're lucky enough to be able to dive in our local waters and to reach our dive site at Pantu we have to pass through one of the busiest ports in the world. Probably not many places in the world you get to dive next to a refinery. The waters around Hantu are not known for having the best visibility in the world. But if you're willing to delve beneath the surface, there's actually quite a lot to see. It's a very popular site with macro photographers. We have a lot of seahorses, nudie branch, and more recently people have been seeing sharks and turtles as well. Singapore may not be the top bucket list destination for people to travel halfway around the world to see. But our reefs are surprisingly healthy with quite a lot of fish to see as well. During GUE Community Day I'll be taking a group of Rep 1 divers who have never been to Hantu before. So it'll be very interesting to see what they think about our local dive site. Hopefully everyone's staying safe and is able to get out and enjoy the, a day of diving for GUE Community Day. Hello everyone, this is Faisal Gahtani from View Kuwait. Uh, today we're going to have a quick diving trip with the community. Stay with us to see how it looks like. <laughs> Starting the day with a cup of coffee. And this is the GU community that I have. <laughs> We're the only GU equity, the two of us. <laughs> Welcome back, we are heading to our boat. Not our boat, this is a dive center boat. <laughs> One day we'll have our boat, inshallah, for GU Kuwait only. What is it? Yes, we're heading out now, getting ready to our dive, uh, for our dive to enjoy our time. Salami. Yeah. Ah, oh, really? Ready. Thank <laughs> you. 
It was good. Rafe and I uh, keep this up. Yes, yes. Hello. That was diving for today. I'm heading back to the marina and see you there. Ciao. Welcome back. This is uh, Abdullah, Captain Abdullah Snein. He's the owner of Scuba Tech Dive Center. Thank you for having us with you today. Thank you. So we just had lunch. This is the end of our day. We hope all of you enjoyed the UNI Community Day. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. Awesome stuff. So great to see everybody from around the world there. We're getting a number of different videos uh, throughout the day, actually, in all three of our sessions. Uh, so it's exciting to see that's that's re that's really great. And I was wondering why when we mentioned the Kuwait video, we started out with some uh, guys that looked like they were a uh, very nice Dutch accent in a windy area. So uh, we played those a little in reverse and it was great to see the diversity of those activities. And I love the two person community. All communities have to start somewhere, right, Kenzie? That's how we all begin. One or two, three, four, you grow it slowly. GUE began the same way with just a few of us. Uh, so don't let that discourage you. Uh, great to see you guys uh, out there in Kuwait building our community and, and really all around the world. Okay, so we're we're a little bit past our scheduled time, but not doing too good. And, and what we had slated up next is a little uh, Q&A session with Dorada Cherney, our recreational administrator, board of directors, all around hard work, work ethic and passionate diver. If we can bring Dorada in, let's, let's chat with her a little bit and see what she's got going on. Hey, Dorada. Loving the new haircut. I hope everybody else is too. You're muted at the moment. Uh, come on in. Yeah, now now I'm back. Yes, I was just enjoying the the videos. I really like the Hussein one from Kuwait because you yeah, know I remember, we, we had him on the boat in the Red Sea. It was a lot of fun as well. Yeah, I mean, we, I started the same way. It was like one person, two people, then it was three, and you know, it, everybody starts in the same way. So I really encourage everybody not to be discouraged about being only the, the only person in the area. So, yes, exactly. And the, people lose sight of that all the time. Think if they're not launching up scale really fast, then they shouldn't bother, and there nothing could be further from the truth. So we had some questions for you. Uh, I don't know, like we'll at least get to a couple of these and maybe we'll, we'll peter the, a couple more during the day. Uh, maybe you can tell folks why we thought it was a good idea to get more seriously into recreational diving. Uh, to be honest, I have heard that question so many times already from the moment we started to do that. Why we should do that? Because we are the, the, the hardcore tech cave explorers, people that are diving deep and far away and being very extreme but um, i started as well as a recreational diver and everybody starts there i mean nobody's born as an explorer who jumps out of the ground being the you know the the, the most advanced diver so we, everybody starts somewhere and for me the, the the need for creating the recreational curriculum comes from the experience that i have as an instructor because i was working in egypt for a very long time so it's, it was the prime destination where many people have been trained and then for me, the worst experience I always had was when I was seeing how sometimes, not always, but sometimes poorly people have been trained and that they have been discouraged from this adventure from the beginning because the training that they got have not been enough. So that was for me the main reason why uh, we should be trying to reach as many of those people who are really excited about diving and then help them to start in a way that will be sustainable for them. So they will not get discouraged in the beginning because, you know, as a beginner, you don't know what you don't know, as one of our friends keeps saying. And then I believe that we can show them a way that will make them dive and will stay them dive. And, and the other reason for me is as well that as we are an agency who is striving for excellence in, in training as well, why we should only recycle divers in a way. So why we should not have our own programs that we start training people from the beginning the way we believe for our purposes is the best. So I would say ultimately it's much easier for people as well, you know, if they can learn from the beginning rather than try to le relearn after having developed so many bad habits over time. Yes, and I think we will struggle for a while a little bit because our the perception of the global diving community for uh, about GUE is that we are only cave and tech, which is not really the case because we have plenty of very enthusiastic recreational instructors like Gemma, for instance, who was showing us the video from Singapore, or Hussein, who wants to be a Rec 1 instructor and he's finishing his path. 
because he wants to introduce this way of training to his small but still growing community. And with those type of people, I think we will get the biggest effects. So reaching young generations and then, you know, reaching people that are, so the next generation of explorers kind of, they need to come out from somewhere. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's easy for one to sit on the sidelines and criticize, you know, uh, the, the limitations of current open water training or recreational training. But if we don't get in and, and really establish a foundation, then we don't have much right to complain. So thanks very much for your stewardship and your efforts in that regard. It's an exciting development. Uh, maybe one more question. Uh, yeah. How do you feel? Yeah, one um, more. I mean, it's Nico who is in charge of that. Well, things. we're already beyond our time. So I don't know. I suppose if people really had a tight timeline, they tuned out. Uh, let's say you want to talk about how the GUE primers work uh, versus REC2, how those those interact. We had a question uh, mm -hmm. about that. Okay. So what we have, uh, we do have, for those who do not know, we do have an um, entry level program, which is the recreation level one. And then we have uh, the second uh, course that the person can take, which is uh, recreational level two. And in fact, it consists of three separate, or it could be done as a three separate primers, which is a navigation primer, rescue primer, or a triox primer. And really depending on uh, what the goal of the diver is, I would suggest to either go for a full, uh, maybe not a full course, but a course that is done in one go, for instance, if you go on holiday or if you are having, you know, like a two weeks vacation or a 10 day or week, you can just schedule those three primers one after the other and make it as a one rec level two class. But uh, the other primers, they are super useful for anybody else because um, we noticed that um, rescue, for instance, is not really, it's not thing that people gladly practice because it's somehow harder and it's always requires a little bit of uh, physical activity and it's a little bit messy sometimes and it requires a little bit more commitment. So, and it is extremely important skill. Um, so this can be taken separately. The same goes with navigation. So for people who are aiming to go to um, uh, projects or who would like to make a, a scientific diving course, the use of compass and understanding how you can navigate, not only using the compass, but as well using the environment is extremely important. So I think what we have created with the REC2 and the primers is just catering for the needs of the people who are planning to do more courses, because the more prepared you are with the basic fundamental skills, the easier the training will be. So entering a scientific class, without having not only, you know, proper buoyancy and maneuvering techniques, but we know knowing how to use a compass will be a little bit of a tricky path for you. And it, the class will not be as effective as it could be. So both, I mean, all of them, they have been created with the goal in mind that they should be useful for the people who are pursuing more advanced classes. Okay, excellent. I lied. I want one more question. I just, we might have some people out there that are interested in becoming recreational instructors. Uh, can you give them any guidance? What would be the first step they should take or, you know, where, how should they get going? So I hope there will be quite many trying to become Jewish recreational instructors, but the first thing anyway, you would need to do is a Jewish fundamentals class, which doesn't mean uh, that it has to be done in a twin set. So with double tanks, or in a dry suit, it can be done in a wetsuit in a single tank as well, because uh, without knowing the, um, the Jewy philosophy or without learning how the teamwork works, without learning the level of awareness that we are trying to uh, foreground when we are teaching people without having, you know, good experience with the equipment, it will be very hard to become a successful instructor. So, even if, it, even if the path sounds a little bit more complicated than in other agencies, because we require potentially more, uh, I would not get discouraged. And then maybe I can point you out as well to a series of videos that uh, uh, we have been recording for instructor candidates that you can see on GUI TV, which is, uh, this series is not uh, behind the paid wall, it's available for everybody, where I explain a little bit about motivation, a little bit about how you can prepare uh, what challenges there will be and what we would be expecting. So I think taking the fundamentals class plus reviewing those videos might be a quite good start for those who are motivated to become an instructor with us, not only on rec level, but generally as a fundamentals level as well. 
Yeah, those are a great series of videos, actually. So I do encourage those of you interested. You did a great job helping to draw out a lot of those issues. And we have Anton. Hey, Anton, nice to hear from you asking uh, how many people are following the program. It's more expensive uh, and it's difficult for non-divers to really assess quality, which, of course, all those things are are true. I think the split you know, between the recreate in the recreational program, allowing a supervised diver and then a full rec one is really facilitating dive shops to create a more comparable product because, you know, your patty open water class and your GUE rec one are quite different in terms of included nitrox and skills and SMB and a lot of things that are put into that rec one program. Uh, do you have anything else you want to say about that, Dorana? Um, I would say to, uh, to, to, to talk to Anton as well is then how the people can evaluate the quality. And of course, I mean, one thing that we need to understand as well that potentially GUI course might not be for everyone because we do require more time and then we do require a little bit more skill and a little bit more, it's a little bit harder. But um, I think the hardness is as well a perspective from on, on our side, divers who have been trained differently and then enter GUI and then we understand how hard the training could be to relearn. That's why the entry level at the GUI level is important for us because then they, they will not need to unlearn anything and they will not be aware that it's harder. They will just follow the instruction of the instructors. I have done a few of those classes. We have quite many people teaching successfully. And the most important thing for those divers is they, are keep, keep, they, they keep on diving because the level of skill is so high they, they are that they keep on diving, but they are not aware about how high the skills levels are until they compare themselves sometimes with some other divers trained in some other agencies. So we do have a, a, we do have a way of introducing the way we train to people who have not been diving before. And I have done that as well several times, which is people call it the discover diving or this intro thing, but it is a little bit different because one of the reasons for that program to be there is to just show how GUI is actually training. So it's not only about showing what diving is, but as well the methodology that GUI is using to train divers. And it should show what, the, what type of training the person will uh, receive and what type of engagement from instructor's perspective and sight the person can expect. So the, the Discover Diving that we have created is not only for people to just know about diving, but as well the way they will be trained, which for many people helps to take the decision, yes, I would like to go through that path. Excellent. Thanks very much. And I, and I agree. I think that the, those tools have really helped some of our GUE dive centers uh, to give people that proper experience. And we've seen a more than doubling of our Rec 1 students uh, in the most recent year and, and more direct answer to Anton's question. So, you know, we are seeing traction and it does take time, of course, for people to make that commitment and spend the extra time. But I think as you indicate, when they, when they get that experience and they stay diving and they're excited and happy and then relay that information on to their fellow uh, friends, then, then that starts to make a big difference. Uh, so thanks very much. We appreciate that, Gerada. Uh, thanks for coming on and giving us a little overview. Lovely to have you, and I love the hair. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, we are actually in, in response uh, to Vincenzo. We are working on uh, a number of different strategies for a worldwide map. We have a, a couple options uh, that will allow people in the future to opt in to that from a locator perspective. We're building a community-based platform that would allow people to identify each other, find each other, and then link up for dives. So we do have that on the plan, and thanks uh, thanks for that, that question as well. Um, Hellraiser, I love it, I love the name. Um, I think that it can be, uh, you know, I can appreciate your perspective and your position. Uh, you don't necessarily need to go back to an an entry level tech setup, unless you're meaning rebreather versus open circuit. I'm not quite sure of the nature of that question. Uh, maybe I can take it in the next session if you uh, can clarify for us. Thanks again, Dorado. We appreciate those answers. And uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this session and bring you back for our next session. So everybody realize or remember that we do have another broadcast at uh, 12 p.m. GMT time. So too many time zones around the world for me to try to represent everywhere, but you can all figure that one out pretty easily. And we have a very similar format, though almost all different guests. So there's only... Uh, a couple of us that'll be repeats. Sorry, I have to come back as well. Uh, but then we have a whole range of other individuals coming in from all around the world. We've got uh, our, Scotland, uh, our Scotland team coming in. We've got people from Sweden and Chile. 
uh, Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. We've got people coming from North Florida. Uh, we got Gareth Locke coming up in the next range. We've got Mara coming from Sardinia to give us some uh, information about the great activities there. Uh, we've got a video from Poland and from Kirill in Florida. So we got lots of stuff coming up in the next session. We will be happy to entertain additional back and forth questions from you as well. So keep those coming. The Q&A is, is very welcome and encouraged. I hope some of you can make a time for at least one more slot and uh, let us know if we haven't addressed anything that you have on your mind and we'll try to get it in a more featured uh, perspective in the next session. So thanks very much, everybody. It's been great to have you here. Really exciting to see all of our uh, friends and make new friends from all around the world. Really hoping to see you in the next session or in the future and uh, hopefully in person in the very near future. So take care, enjoy your day or your afternoon or your night as the case may be. Uh, thanks again for joining. We hope to see you soon.